Well, what did we do? <clears throat> We're on a good problem tonight. And I want to see whether I can fully communicate the nature of the problem. Essentially, the problem is about man and the whole problem of life after death. It's a special kind of problem. It has several aspects. But essentially, this is the problem. Let this represent a line of existence. So we're born here, we go through all kinds of things, and so we die. Next, under the assumption of reincarnation, pass into another world, and then, of course, return. Call it the problem of reincarnation. And I put another word in it. It's the problem of justice and reincarnation. Of course, the problem is first that whatever good you've achieved, or negatives, whatever they may be, if they have any consequence on one's experiences in the realm of the dead, does it have any effect on what may be said to be open to us in the experience of the world of the dead? In a curious, very curious way, we can dramatize this by saying, if this was a universe in which reincarnation could take place, and you could profit by all that you have learned and all that you've done, both positive and negative, then this would be a learning experience. And therefore, if there were a learning experience, then coming back into this world, you would then be much better than you were before. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, if this is the case, would you even have ever done the negatives that you've done if you were all born pure and free of any negativity? Look here, hold that for a moment. So, in this curious universe, let us make one, all right, where you really learn in the next world and then are reborn. If you then have learned all of this, <clears throat> you either forgot it on birth, or it shapes your character. <laughs> Fundamental attitudes. And if that's the case, either we forgot it, we forgot all of that learning, and therefore it didn't help us any, unless we can recall it. And if that learning then shaped us and shapes our character, then would it not follow that we should be better for each reincarnation? And which is why, as you notice in this world, people are always getting better. So there's one aspect there no. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. As we go through each life and we grow, we get new challenges each time. That's a possibility, right? Then the things that you've learned, there are so many new challenges that you only make those mistakes in that arena that is new to you. And therefore, people that live in traditional ways and reincarnated in traditional ways would become the wise and the good since they have nothing particularly new. Um, Something you never learn. Uh-oh. 
Now, let me add another one to this. To whatever degree, let's move this now from learning, suppose there's no learning. Suppose there is only punishment for the negatives and rewards for the goods. Now, if that's the case, if that's the case, there's no learning. And you're simply paid off. That's your, your kind of go into the next world with your bank account of all of your deeds, right? A kind of itemized account. And so you get punishment rewards. No learning. Uh-oh. If that's the case, then each time you return, you're not going to learn anything here. It's not a realm of learning. Then if that's the case, the only place then you can learn is here. Well, that's rather interesting. Then there's a great, there must be a great emphasis on what kind of learning can make a person better than he was before. <clears throat> because <clears throat> whatever kind of learning a person goes through, it won't make any difference if he continually picks up punishments and rewards, especially more and more punishments. So it has to be, if this is what we're doing in this existence of ours, there had better be some way we can gain a, an insight into why we are doing these negative things. And it may equally be while, we, while we're doing the rewards, because it may be that we're only getting uh, rewards for small things and we're missing the higher. And therefore, there may be greater rewards that we are ignorant of. So therefore, if there is a learning in this world, in this life, then it should off open, up, open up the possibility for us for greater goods or rewards, the things that we will later get greater rewards for, and lessen the negatives so that we will get little, if any, punishment. Right? That's what the kind of learning we should really get. Right? The kind of learning we most need, then, is to open up the, po the possibility of greater good so then we can get greater rewards in the next world and lessen the negatives so when we die once more, we will have even less punishment. Therefore, punishments will decrease. But nonetheless, whatever it is, whatever punishments, whatever negatives they be, to whatever extent, we're going to be paying for those. And therefore, that's another dilemma we have. Hmm. I don't see any dilemma. Pardon me? I don't see any dilemma. Because each time you learn, when you go through school, in the first grade, you have lessons to learn. Then you go to the second grade, and you have challenges. You're so right. But we're going to have to discover the kind of learning that most definitely benefits man, okay. especially the highest good. And unless we can in some way bring people to see that, they're going to keep coming back for lesser goods and lesser goods. So we have to identify those greater goods and bring man in some way to see that those are the essential things to pursue and gain. Yeah. Otherwise, he's going to continually come back because he's missed the, the golden, the, right, the, the brass ring or the golden chain. Yeah. Right. Well. <clears throat> I just wanted to throw this up for a moment. Now go to, go to Plato's Gorgias. And that's a myth dealing with this issue. Now there's something curious about this. First, Plato calls it a true tale, which helps. Well, he starts out this story by pointing out that at first, the universe was ruled by Kronos. And people then were judged before they died, um, on their last breath, as it were, they were judged before they, were di before they died. And therefore, they still had the clothes and the attire of their earthly life that was still there. And people around them were doing the judging. So good heavens, all kinds of things happen, as you can imagine. People were going to the wrong places. So finally, Zeus got upset with this. He recently took on the, the, 
the domain of, of uh, guiding this universe of ours. And he said, this must stop. We have to bring about some real radical change in this. But one thing was always true. He said, one thing, one law respecting the test testing of man must be in place, and that is, he who lives his life in justice and holiness shall go when dead to the islands of the blessed, that should be S-S-E-D, of course, and dwell in perfect happiness, but those who, of course, have not lived well in injustice and vice, they go to the house of vengeance for punishment. So, he has two possibilities. One, you're off to the islands of the blessed, And, of course, Tartarus, that place which we have heard about before, and for a punishment. Now, there has to be a change in, in judgment, of course. And so, uh, after Pluto objected that souls were found their way to the wrong places, Zeus said, I'll put a stop to that, and he did it. Now, Zeus was in charge, as you know, in the heavens, Poseidon of the seas, and Pluto the underworld. Well, this is what he said. Look here. We must do this. We must stop this judgment of man. We must deprive him, we must deprive man of their foreknowledge. We, they must be stripped before they're judged. And the judge who judges them must themselves be naked. The souls must be naked. Therefore, his soul naked, the judge then will pierce into the other soul and see its true condition. Then they can judge. He's going to change the judges. He said, my two sons will be in charge of Asia, Minos and Radamanthus. And Europe, Achaeus. Now, Minos is going to hold the court of appeals. If there's any kind of worry to complex judgment, we'll give it to Minos. And that's why there are two there. So, add in another thing. The judgment must happen as soon as a person is dead. Very quick. Now look at What are you going to judge? Well, you're going to judge, according to Plato, the condition of the soul. Well, how do you see the condition of the soul? He says, well, you know, he said, this is the condition. He said, take the body first. He said, each body retains, to a great degree, whatever it has done. It carries the habits of the body, whatever it is, has an impact on the body itself. And therefore, the habits of the body, whatever habit of the body is still visible after death on the soul. All the natural accidents of the soul are open to view. So then what do you see? Well then, you see all the habits that the person has had in their, in their waking world, its impact on the body, all of that will be visible in the soul, and the soul itself will have all the natural things that it went through, all the accidents, all the things that it has experienced, so it will have both. Now here's the interesting thesis. What does that mean? It means that the soul is affected by all that it has caused. All that it's caused, that affects it. We think of it the other way around. No, no. He's saying whatever the soul has caused, it affects the soul. Therefore, all the acts and deeds that it does, it has its effect back on the soul and so stains it. Therefore, it's marked and therefore it has a record. Therefore, it can be seen. Now, I'm going to talk about punishment first for a few minutes. If a person is rightly punished, according to Plato, they become better, and they profit by it. And there's another way in which people can, be, uh, pro can profit by punishment. When you can see examples 
then you may learn from what you see because if you see what they suffer and what they feared, it may produce a fear in you to avoid those things, and that's important. Malachar. There are two kinds, two kinds of punishments. The kind that where the souls are curable and those that are not curable. The curable are punished and improved by pain and suffering. This is all from Plato. And he has this curious statement, for there's no other way by which they can be delivered from evil. Those guilty of the worst crimes, they're incurable and they're made examples in the house of punishment or Tartarus. So you have two sets in here. You have those that are going to be curable and those incurable. The incurable become the examples. The cured then will go through suffering, and in that pain and suffering, they'll be improved. <clears throat> now, if those people who are incurable are punished forever, well, that means eternal punishment or is it only for a period? If these are, in fact, the incurable ones, and they are then, as the Greek has it, right, forever, always in a time of, always in that time, or forever, then their punishment is forever. But if their punishment is forever, That violates the whole idea we expressed before. No, no growth. Not only that, if the person cannot benefit but what they go through, then they're really be, being consigned to vice forever. Ah, this is, this is indeed curious. Look here now. Here's the problem. If punishment does not in any respect benefit us, if it doesn't benefit us, nor if it doesn't bring us to a better condition, then it's inflicted in vain. And the agent that does it is acting in vain. If the soul is always punished, it never enjoys good, then the soul is always in vice. Now, these are quotes from Plato. These are all quotes from Plato in the same dialogue. Now, how can you reconcile that? The myth is saying something that is not consistent with the, the dialogue itself. In the dialogue, these points are made. These points are made. But if we can see, consider these points, it doesn't match up to this dialogue, uh, pardon me, to the myth. That's your problem. Because if the soul has, re has gone through great vice while living, and those kinds of vices, by the way, are considered primarily, primarily the condition of having a great crime, is that you have to have great power, political power, and if you have great political power, you can then, be, you can then have the power to do great injustices. Mm -hmm. Therefore, these uncurables are all the tyrants, the great mass killers. Mm -hmm. They say they drop down, <clears throat> they're incurable. But that's very strange because it doesn't fit this. Doesn't fit it at all. Now, there are many people who argue about this and they try to find ways to get around it because they don't want, if for some reason, we don't want to come to that conclusion. 
But that's the conclusion he comes to. I can read you several sections and you can see it yourself. Yeah, there's a part of reality then that sounds like it's not going to always be. Pardon me? There's a Can't part hear. of reality then that sounds like it will never be able to be cured. It's a part of reality that if it's filled with those kinds of souls that are in principle incurable, never do anything good, it's vice, it's evil. I don't know whether it takes on a demonic side or they simply go to a bottomless pit and they can never get out, but nonetheless there's a place in the universe that by very difficult to say there's any good in it. Yeah? You wrote the Spirit of Destiny. They claim that they could go back into the, the lives of Hitler, previous lives. And they said they followed the pattern. He was very, he had a, a situation where he was making love, I guess, to somebody's wife. Mm -hmm. And they cut off his testicles. Mm -hmm. And he carried that resentment clear down into different lives and into this one where he was, he came like an incurable. Well, and that had a lot to do with his. But if incurable, if they do come back, <laughs> They are the sources of all the mass destruction and evil and murder and yeah. suffering among That's mankind. True. Well, if they are there, we don't want them up. Let them stay there. Yeah. But wait a minute. That's vengeance. Yeah. That's vengeance. It's vengeance. Simply, it's vengeance. And it means, in philosophy, it means something far more interesting. It means that you can't reach some people who, even though they have reason, they have a mind, but they can't be reached. All right? That means they're locked out or locked into irrationality. That means it can't be reached. That's the assumption. And they can't be reached either in this world or that one. Well, then there must be something curious about the Creator. Yeah. According to Sazaki, or the, the, the uh, Cimarron Zen Center, mm -hmm. He claimed to be a great saint, you had to be a great sinner. Yeah, but you see, that I, I like that view because that means then they came back. They back this, back. they don't come back. Yeah. But that means that eventually Hitler might become a great saint. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we need them. We all need them. I, I hope he, yeah, we all might. Yeah. <laughs> Given enough time. Yeah. Well, look now. Let's see if I can do some more with this. Let's make sure we have it now. All right. Let's take the other side, which is even more interesting. Let's take the side that's curable. Now look what he's saying about the curable. Oh, rather interesting. I want to go back to it. You see, if they're punished, there's a removal of evil, and they can return. Right, okay, look here. Uh, removal of evil, they pay for with their punishments and suffering, so they suffer, and in that sense, uh, uh, they're pained, pain, suffering, and as a consequence of that, whatever it is that produced that, that evil right, is removed, eliminated, softened sufficiently for the person to be reincarnated. However, but there's no learning. Then, the only thing you're working on is the negative impact on the soul, wherever it's been scarred, wherever the traces of its evil deeds impacts on the soul, those have been eliminated. But that doesn't make it good. It's just that you're paying for the, the punishment for the, for the negatives, for the bad. Yeah, that's not making a better person. So, yeah, that doesn't make a person good. No, no, there's no sense of a good. Well then, 
this, this idea then that there can be something positive, a removal, must be in the house of Tartarus but there is nothing that can reach those that are incurable. Ah, look here, we have to know why they're incurable. And he says, you know, the reason, it's, it's because of the enormity of their crimes. It's the enormity of their crimes. <clears throat> says in a very interesting place here um, it is among the powerful that we find specially wicked men to read you the, the paragraph. who have done extreme wrong and as a result of such, such crimes have become incurable of those are the examples made no longer are they profited at all themselves since they are incurable but others are profited who behold them undergoing for their transgressions the greatest sharpest and most fearful sufferings evermore actually hung up as examples there in the infernal dungeon a spectacle and a lesson to such of the wrongdoers as arrive from time to time it is among the powerful that we find the specially wicked men they have to have that power so they're incurable because of the enormity of their crimes. That's all, the enormity of their crimes. Now, this whole thesis of this eternal punishment comes from one line in the Gorgias. One line. So I'll read you the line. All right, it, therefore, um, he now talks about these terrible, incurable wrongdoers. Among them, I say, Archelaus also will be found, who will be found, if what Polis tells us is true, and every other despot of this sort. And I think, moreover, that most of these examples have come from despots and kings and potentates, public administrators. For these, since they have a free hand, commit the greatest and the most impious offenses. Homer also testifies to this, for he has represented kings and potentates as those who are punished everlastingly in the other world. Tantalus, Sisyphus, Titus. But Therestes, or any other private person who was wicked, 
has, born, has been portrayed by none as incurable and therefore subjected to heavy punishment, no doubt because he didn't have a free hand and therefore was in fact happier than those who had. Homer also testifies to this. For he has represented kings and potentates and those who are punished everlastingly in the other world. Everlastingly in the other world. All right. That's there very clear. Everlastingly in the other world. This is where most people conclude that the incurable therefore go there forever. It's everlasting. It's in this other world and there's no way out. Let me, let me read this once more for you. Homer also testifies to this. For he has represented kings and potentates as those who are punished everlastingly in the next world. Now, this is a, see, if we didn't have this word, if, say, Homer testifies to this, then it would be Homer's view. What does this do? It's also the opinion of the writer. It includes the opinion of the writer. Now, this is not a semicolon, this is a period. Now, I want to write it the way it is in the Greek and English. Testifies to this also Homer. That's the way it appears. And this word is the word and. And when it doesn't have a parallel structure, it often takes the word also. So, testifies to this also Homer. But this whole thesis and its impact on the whole world of Platonic thought and those influenced by Plato, this could also be written this way. And Homer testifies to this period. Now, if that's the case, you see, in what was just said, and I think moreover, <clears throat> most of those examples have come from despots, kings, and potentates, and public administrators. For these, since they have had a free hand, commit the greatest and the most impious offenses. Now, Homer testifies to this. See, there's no antecedent dealing with everlasting punishment. Therefore, it may be just Homer who, who is adding that, not Plato. Right. So this whole thing depends upon one funny little word right here. Isn't that curious? The whole thing hangs on that. Because you could say, and Homer testifies to this, and also, or even with also, Homer testifies to this. But the point that was made referring to this is not everlasting punishment, but despot kings and potentates and public administrators, for these have had a free hand and commit the greatest and the most impious offenses. Well, hey, Homer talks about that. That's all it means. And by the way, Homer adds something, everlasting punishment. Mm -hmm. 
So there's a, th this whole thesis rests upon an ambiguous phrase, an ambiguous sentence, where you have to decide, you have to make a judgment, and it's a personal judgment based upon the way you read it, and hopefully from some kind of study of grammar, of which way it goes. But let me give you another alternative. Whenever you have a whole theory depending upon one word, it's weak in principle. The author, if it's that significant, you have to look somewhere else for it in clearer language, or you can't nail a whole thesis on this kind of an ambiguity. And that's typical of Plato. So therefore, look here. The real thing, therefore, is in this dialogue, he spends a great deal of time on one issue, and that is What is it, what is it in life that benefits a man? Right, benefits mankind. What is it? Now, since he's putting all his effort in exploring this in the waking world, this leads to the conclusion, if not by omission, that this is the place for learning. This is the chance for growth and development and psychic development. And he has a four, he has basically a grid. Four things. He said, you know what? He says, um, when you're concerned with the body, there are two particular activities that are absolutely essential because the body breaks down. So you need gymnastics and that's the whole what we would call all of the process that make man in his physical form excellent. Right? Great health, great yoga, hatha yoga, all of those things. He said, Come, but you also have something else. And you need that, and you need medicine. In order for the body to be physically fit, since it cannot maintain itself, it, man is not a self-correcting mechanism, he doesn't repair himself, therefore to bring about the full health of the body, you need two things, medicine and gymnastics. He says, hey, hey, it's enough of the soul. So you need something similar. You need something similar. And take a look now. Medicine is a repair. It's corrective. So in that sense, you can say that we can picture a man, right? we can picture a man who is in poor health. Medicine brings him, medicine brings him not to full health, it brings him to non-illness. Then to go from non-illness, you no longer have any disease or any difficulties with your physical body, you now need to go to someone else to bring you to the full level of physical health. That's gymnastics. Right. Ah, now take the same thing over here. Right. Uh, there is something that must so if there is anything that the body suffers, it's it is disease. Injury. And it makes it less than its full functioning. Is there something, now remember when we use the word soul in the modern world, we often use the word mind. Right. What is it about someone who has a sick mind? What do we say, what word do we give that? Mentally ill. Mentally ill. Mentally ill. Emotional. Yeah, yeah. We say he suffers some parallel disease and injury, 
either organic, right, it has some organic or psychological conflicts, don't we? We say he needs to be repaired. Now, when a person therefore overcomes that particular illness, they are no longer ill. Do you need another art that can take them further? Because just because they have repaired the physical body doesn't mean they're in full health. You then have to take them again to someone then who can develop most fully that full potential of man. Now using Plato's language, he says the disease of the soul is vice. Right? And that vice is the condition where man cannot act cannot act and cannot achieve what he wants, that for the sake of which he acts. Right? He cannot act and cannot achieve what he ideally wants. Now he's a special name for that and I'll get that in a few minutes. So you have to find out what it is that's blocking that. That would be comparable over here on the level of the soul. Let's call it a therapy of the soul. Now in the same way, that's corrective. What would take a person beyond that to reach the fullest potential there is now, long, now that he, he, can, he can't be blocked. Now do you need something else or is that sufficient? And here's the whole drama. For Plato, this is, of course, philosophy or the dialectic. This is the philosophical. This is reaching for the highest vision. Therefore, you know, you can take someone like this, bring him here. Now that he's in good physical shape, bring him here. Find a corrective measures and then finally bring him here. Therefore, he can go through those four stages. He says, hey, you know what, there's something curious about this. He says, you know, uh, there's something very curious, he says. There is something that masks itself as these four. He says, look here, cookery, cookery gives the appearance that the foods are good for you. Cookery is a mask. It makes it appear that what you're eating is good for you. Therefore, it's a form of flattery. Right? <laughs> hey, look here. So therefore, that creates the impression, oh, you're really living good, even though, right, even though your you, cookery may be killing you. And in gymnastics, there is fashion. Fashion can make you appear as if you are really in good shape when you're not. So therefore, for each of these, there's something that masks it and gives the appearance of it. They say, you know what? Over here, there's something similar. Two things, rhetoric and sophistry. Because with a certain amount of rhetoric, you can disguise many things. And we can call that rationalization. We can call that denial. We can call that all of those mechanisms that deny the truth about our reality. And therefore, it gives the appearance that we are in really good condition. Ah, sophistry. Sophistry. What? Now we can appear wise by clever arguments and appearing good. So therefore, the ideal thing to do is to bring a group of people to a great restaurant, having looking your best, 
having your most interesting denials of anything wrong with you, right? And persuade them that you're wise and you're giving the mask the appearance of these four great arts. He said, but he said, the real issue, the real issue though, we can play this game on all those four levels. He says, but the real thing is that the best for man comes not by chance, but by order, truth, and art. Now he's using the word art in just this one thing. Each one of these things can benefit a person. Anything that benefits a person, that brings them into a better way of being, in the Greek world, takes on that great word, art. We always have to be careful about that because it doesn't mean what we mean in the modern world. Now, what that means then is through these things that man is trying to achieve an order. Now, what does he mean by an order? The proper arrangement inherent in each thing. That's its intrinsic order. And the soul has its own order. And he said, you don't have to add it. That's intrinsic to man. You have to reach that level of order intrinsic to man and let it emerge. Because the cosmos is an ordered system. The whole thing is an ordered system. Ah, now wait. Pardon? That's what Christian Murray used to say. No, no. But Absolutely. People are using mind control and trying to tell oh, yeah. what to do. Yeah, intrinsic. Yeah. Intrinsic. See, in, in this sense, what you're trying to do is drop out of that and the rhetoric and the sophistry that you're persuading yourself of your condition and all of that and then discover on the level of the soul what you discover here that is when you get rid of the disease and the injury there's a natural human order in the in the in the physical body that emerges and you want to enhance that with gymnastics it's not a new order you're imposing it's one that's intrinsic. Well, that's yeah. In yeah, yeah, right. That you're bringing out. Pardon? That you're bringing out. That you're bringing out or allowing to emerge. Yeah. Now, what does this mean? He says, for a man then, there's a great power. And the meaning of this great power, the meaning of man's great power, is only when he benefits, right? He has to benefit. These are ways of benefiting if his actions turn out to his advantage. That's the whole goal. Now, here is an interesting statement I'd like to stay with now. Let's take a look at this idea of benefit. Okay, so this is the central problem of man. And he said, once you understand that, then you can understand this, this great power, the idea of great power. When we, when we, right, when we decide on doing something, right, let's say something positive or something we have doubts about and call it negative for the moment. Right, do we want this? Do we want this? Do we will that? For he wills not that which he does. We don't will this. But what we really will is the sake of which we do it. Now this is curious language, so let me put it in another way. All right? Explain that. Yeah, yeah, we put it in another language. It comes from a, a, a different kind of language, and I'd like to put it up. If I want to build this barn, I need materials. And I need someone to do it. I need something, some force to do it to bring it into existence. That means I need an efficient cause. Well, that could be a workman. Right? 
That can be a workman, right, with a hammer and saw. That's an efficient cause. But just because I have the materials and I have the efficient cause or workman doesn't mean it's going to be done unless there's some plan and design. But even if I have a plan and design and an efficient workman and all the material, it's not going to come into existence until uh, someone wants it, can bring that into existence for some purpose. Right? It need, right? Someone is going to use it. It needs some purpose. Well, I want to use another word for purpose. The purpose is that for the sake of which it came into existence. Notice the language. A purpose is that for the sake of which it came into existence. If you, if you don't have something the sake of which it comes into existence, you have no purpose. So there, the purpose is that for the sake of which it came into existence. That's why you did it. <laughs> we didn't will the house, the barn. You don't will the house. You don't will the house. What do you will? That for the sake of which, right? But for the sake of which, he does it. Another way, the reason for which he does it. So that if you do something good, you do something bad. Isn't it true that what you really are doing is you're doing it for you want it for some reason. You don't just want it, you want it for some reason. The reason or the purpose or the sake of which you do it, that's what you really want it for. So you can be mistaken about what's good or bad, but do you not always want it and desire it because you think for yourself that it's good and to possess it is good for you. Now you might be mistaken, about the means, but nonetheless, we do not agree that's the reason why we do whatever we do. Then that means that there is a great power in man if he benefits, that is, if he can really bring into existence the good that he desires. And you can only do that, you can only do that, aha, you can only do that, curiously enough, through three things. Art. All of these are arts. And you can only do, you can only pursue what you think is good if you have the idea that the reason you're doing it, you're really truthful about the reason why you're doing it, not for some other reason. You're not using rhetoric on it. Now, yeah, hold on. Instead of the word art, you use the word culture. Would that be more meaningful? Culture? Uh, See, unless you can bring someone from a worse condition to a better one and can give the reasons why you do whatever you're doing to, right? and you can follow up whatever you're doing to make sure you reach the goal that you, uh, you have established for that person, it's not an art. Could be by chance. So, benefit is essential. Not only is it essential, but that means there's some process you're following, you have reasons for doing what you're doing, and you can follow up on that with those reasons to see that what you're doing, whether or not it in fact achieves the goal that you desire, which is to bring about a benefit. If it doesn't have those things, it's not an art. And that's an essential, absolutely essential idea in Greek thought, which is totally missing in modern thought. It's the basis of natural law. 
which we'll, we'll go into a little bit, a little bit later. That brings into discussion all the art of the Orient and the, yeah. the yeah. you know, West did art for its own sake as an expression of worship of God, like uh, yeah. doing the cathedrals. What I would like to do now is change what we've just said. He's going to call this legislation. He's going to call this justice. And that's why it doesn't make any sense to us. Legislation is the dialectic? Is that what you're saying? He's saying that the particular art that's required is legislation. The particular art that mirrors medicine is justice. And would you not agree I've thrown you now into confusion? Because it made sense before. That's right. It made sense before. It doesn't make any sense now. Because what we mean by justice has a thing to do with what they mean by justice. It's totally, absolutely, a totally different concept. And one reaches it. See, one, this is really justice is, in other word, a higher sense of justice um, let me give it to you. When each part of anything is playing its proper role for the good of the whole, that's justice. That's order. Mm -hmm. oh. That's order. That's order. Mm -hmm. But we don't use it that way. Right? We don't use it. With the concept of harmonious, we interrelate it. Yes, and you can reach it through a, a discipline. You can reach it through a discipline. It's something you have to study, master. We don't have that notion in English. No. And legislation is just what the people up in Sacramento and Washington do. That hasn't anything similar to gymnastics, to say the least, right? I mean, matter of fact, we might say it's the opposite. You want to downsize and reduce down the common denominator? Now, you see, Legislation for him is not what we mean by legislation, but it's the highest vision you can have for a society to bring about its ideal form. That's legislation. So therefore, when we use these words in translations, very few people can follow it because this word presupposes you know the republic and you've cracked the republic. And that means with this view of justice, you can see how legislation fits once you have that. But unless you grasp the idea of justice in Plato's Republic, this is totally, un to totally unintelligible. But it does have one aspect that I would like to focus on. He keeps going back to this one idea and I would like to bring it back to you. Yeah, they're using justice in a different way than we use it. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah. There is no other way by which they can be delivered from evil than by punishment. He repeats this theme again and again and again. If you're rightly punished, you become better and you profit by it. He is definitely moving in that direction. That punishment, therefore, that's the only way in which you can ever be delivered from evil. And therefore, rightly punish means to become better and you profit by it. That plays a, re re a repeating role throughout this entire dialogue. Now, 
the difficulty with that is from the same dialogue, these two quotes. What does he mean by punishment? It must benefit us. It must bring us to a better condition. And for him, for him, the removal of the evil is making you better, but it doesn't make you good. <laughs> and that's the problem. And that's the problem with the uh, this dialogue. This is uh, this is the problem of this dialogue. That he he what I put in its place, what I put in place, philosophy, dialectic, and this therapy of the soul. That's not in Plato. That's what I introduced, which we introduced together. We can see that because if psychology ever becomes an art, that's what it ideally should do. It's struggling to do that. It's it's whether it ever achieves it or not is up to the up to history and creative genius of many men. But uh, Plato doesn't move in this direction. This direction is Homeric, not Platonic. And that's the difference between the Platonic and the Homeric vision of man. Homer wants to take, and does take, how you can take a person who is in a, in a very, very, very clear way Someone who should should be um, charged, Achilles. <laughs> Achilles is in the height the height of the of the uh, the Iliad. He puts his his armor on his friend, Proclus. He's going to make him believe. He's going to enter him into battle, so he appears like Achilles. Then everyone is going to think it's Achilles in the battle. And he has a great image, and he has a great role. And therefore, he tells Proclus, only go so far. Don't go too far beyond the tree out there. Don't go too far. He said, by that, he said, once I enter the battle, then I'll get my girlfriend back, who's being held in ransom, mm -hmm. Brasides. And he said, then I'll get all the gifts, because I went into battle. We'll board the ship, and we'll be, we'll be out in the morning. <laughs> this type of person. Homer shows how he sees through the folly, how he turns around, strips himself from all of those pretenses, turns around and becomes a pure warrior with the highest ideal. That's what he does. That means he went through some personal change, had to face himself on many levels, which he had to do, including dealing with uh, Hector's father and things of that nature that go through the through the play. I keep calling it a dialogue. So that's a Homeric. Homer is interested in seeing the individual and what what he goes through to try to become better, and has to face the personal conflicts to become better. He does that in the Odyssey as well. Plato doesn't do that. Plato doesn't do that. Plato is into a kind of yoga. A philosophical yoga. It doesn't go to the roots of why you believe what you do and how to face what you believe and overcome those, those beliefs which are the cause of all your irrational behavior. He doesn't go on that level. That's Homeric. This is Platonic. That's the essential difference between the two. So you prefer Homer? Oh, I'm a lover of Homer. I'm more Homeric than I am Platonic, though there's obviously a great parts of Plato that I, I'm deeply uh, attracted to and fond of and love. But for a vision of man, the way I see man, I, I view man homerically, not, not platonically. Uh, put it in another way. In Plato, you see, he has four divisions. He has pure, beautiful reasoning, <coughs> understanding, belief, and image thinking. These are the ways in which the soul operates. It can go uh, in its development, so the soul goes up this what is called the divided line. Mm -hmm. He spends nearly all of his time dealing with these two. Mm -hmm. He describes the condition of belief, but he never goes to the root of belief and never describes exactly how we come to the beliefs we have which control us, which causes the suffering, the agony, and the ruination in our lives and our fellow man. He only approaches this in general. 
Homer goes to it in particular. And there's always a solution. You must always, when you try to resolve personal problems, you must discover the particular belief that's functioning. What are the particular circumstances that brought that belief believable, how it became believable, and the role it has on the individual. It's always particular. It's never gen a general solution to a human problem doesn't help anybody. But if a person can grasp the particular circumstances they came to in their life that added to their belief about themselves and about their reality, if you can find the conditions that made that believable so that they can then disengage it, that's, that's individual growth. That's Homeric. Plato, he has a beautiful, magnificent philosophical yoga that shows the condition we're in for believing in image thinking, but he has no particular solution to how to break out of this level. He starts from here. What's the word by the law of reasoning? Uh, reasoning, understanding, belief, image thinking. I see. Like our culture bombards us with images mm -hmm. to make us believe certain things about ourselves and reality. It doesn't want to push through reflecting on it and trying to understand what's going on and what it does to us and whether or not it's bringing us about into a, a better way of existence. Christianity just stops at belief. Oh, yeah. That's the whole thing. Well, see, this was considered, this is called the irrational part of man. Yeah. So Christianity, what it did was took, the, took what the Greeks cast out and made it the saving grace faith and belief. Yeah. And therefore, since all men can get into this, belief therefore can have universal appeal. This does not. This is, this is an intellectual trip, understanding, reasoning. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah. Now, there's, there's a book called, I read a book called uh, about Zoroaster. Yeah. Comparing Zoroaster with Greek thought. Oh yes, indeed. And they claim Very that the Zoroaster felt that the, uh, when a person, uh, mm -hmm. the prophet, mm -hmm. in other words, when a person has a direct insight mm -hmm. to things, then that goes beyond the reason. Yeah. That to him was yeah. higher. This is true here in Platonic world, too. Yeah. The, the highest vision goes beyond reasoning. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, but that's the Republic. Which is a, a different kind of uh, complex work. So I wanted to bring you to the fact that for Plato, there is still this. This is very different than, than where I think the way our culture is going and the challenge we have. The challenge we have, I think, is the very thing I mentioned, which is that we have to find a therapy of the soul. We have to find a way to cure a man of the beliefs that are ruinous to them. And appealing to justice may do it so long as you understand justice and it really shouldn't even use that word because it's so different than what we mean by justice. Well, our idea of justice is violence and the right people, like John Wayne. John who? What's his name? <laughs> John Wayne. If he does it, it's all right. If he considers violence for good, then it's okay. Oh, he beats up on the bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. And John Wayne beats up on the bad guys because he's more violent than they are. Yeah. yeah, well, we teach violence in our images yeah. and we punish people for acting out their violence. Yeah. <laughs> what did you do? Yeah. yeah. Exactly what my culture told me to do. Yeah. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, well, this yeah. is. This is our culture, that's why. All movies today are seem to, most of them seem to, all these action movies are based on that idea. Violence overcoming violence. No, you see, what we don't have, what we don't have are movies for this. No, no, that doesn't. Uh... Or even to show this homerically. Yeah. That would be really great. Mm -hmm. Well. But we, we don't do that. Or, um, there's nothing, no reason why we can't. No. But I don't think they'll make a buck out of it, so I think they hold back. I th would you agree somehow our culture is influenced by money? Well, a little bit. Bad. A little bit. I mean, I can risk that opinion. <laughs> Just a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's influenced by what they think will sell at the box office. That's all. Well, but you know, there are a lot of experimental things going on, and let's hope it's a change. And, yeah, and, uh, that's true. And we're all interested in fighting and uh, making, making a difference. So, 
Thank you. I wanted to bring this in. Um, there's, uh, there's a movie out that I'd like you to recommend. Please. It's called The Pig, I think. Or the what? Pig. P-I-G? Yes, yeah, about a pig. <laughs> and some people have recommended that as the best movie of the year. P-I-G. You're not joking. P-I-G. Pig. Yeah. And it's literally a story about a pig. Yes, yeah, literally a story about a pig. About a literal pig. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I hope they see. give I hope they give the pig a, a Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> they might give the movie an Oscar. <laughs> Is it a cartoon it's, or? It's kind of a combination. It's a part that's a pig that talks. <laughs> So they have puppeteers that work it, but there's a pig that believes it's a sheep herd dog. No. <laughs> Did we answer the question about the incurables? I missed that. Well, I don't know what you missed. Well, <laughs> I mean, if you missed it, how do you know you missed it? <laughs> I mean, if you missed it, how do you know you missed it? As we were talking about it, and I, have, I don't recall the conclusion. I don't think we came. Oh, it's about that, that one word also. Yeah. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, okay. if your whole thesis has to depend upon one word, it's wonderful. But he said he was going to go here to answer that. I thought that question, because you said you didn't want to end up just resting on one word. So somehow you got into this discussion, and that was, I thought, to answer the question as related to the incurables. I thought that's what you did. No. We, the conclusion to that was that um, in reading any text, if a whole interpretation depends upon one word set in an ambiguous phrase or sentence, it's best not to rest a whole thesis on that one word right. or that phrase. And therefore, we should find that same idea expressed somewhere else in, in sufficient clarity before you assign it to the author of the work as a principal idea of his. Mm -hmm. right. so did Caution. So did we do that? I don't know. Do what? Find it somewhere else in the text to a sufficient degree that you could attribute to Plato or not. Hmm. Well, I know one thing. It's only a couple of pages, and you'll read it. Oh, yeah, I will. Just yeah, see. So mm -hmm. He still says, he still says, um, uh, he still has the idea for uh, forever, mm -hmm. yeah. but again, there's a whole discussion about that use. And if you want the reference to it, Olympia Doris goes at it in great length. But to to go over it, if you want, uh, there there are enough references to suggest in this work that there is a bottomless pit in Tartarus where these people incurably are sent, no doubt. Whether it's eternal punishment or not, that's, there are several places where that's open to question. Because you also have in Plato the idea of periods, long periods. Yeah. Like we went through the other day. But I would say there's room for both views. What about Proclus and Plotinus? Did they ever mm. hold the view that there are some souls that are so bad to the point where... No. Yeah. No. I, I didn't think they would. They're more... No. It's more sublime. No. That we all get a chance. No. This is... Uh, this is true. No. And you see, this doesn't fit this. This is one of the, the, the major problem I wanted to bring up. That... Uh, if there is this, see the reason why there's room, I think, to argue in terms of the text itself, the greater part of it is stressing this point and this point. That if punishment in no respect benefits the individual and it doesn't bring him about into a better condition, then it's, it's, in, then it's in vain. And that means that in the nature of the universe, there's something in vain and therefore has no purpose. And yet it's costing fantastic suffering for the individuals. And therefore, if the soul is always punished forever, it never enjoys a good, then you know what? She's always in vice. And therefore, the condition of someone doing this terrible deed means they are then consigned to a condition where they're always in vice, which is unjust. 
right? Which is unjust. And that would make the Creator unjust. Right. And it would be at odds with the idea so that, that the cosmos is ordered. Yes. It's yeah. Yeah. It's so that would be at odds with the... So it has that, it has that conflict. Yeah. And the so that would be at odds with Plato's original premise that everything is good and right. yeah. turns yeah. back to the good. Yeah. 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 So that's the problem. I wanted to share it with you. And uh, it's there. Uh, we can argue how strong it is by doing what I did and perhaps going back over it once more. But nonetheless, one part of it is very clear, and that is when he's talking about it outside of the myth, there's no doubt about his position. The difficulty is in reconciling that with the myth. Um, yeah, it's, 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 when, you, when you read that quote, it's like these people are used as examples, which in, in themselves are not benefited, but they benefit others. But that's not what the... No, but that's different. No, that's different. Because, I mean, they should actually be benefited. Everyone should, ideally. But well, you have to be brought to a better condition, yeah. mm -hmm. and that better condition should be to your, your benefit, Otherwise, it is in vain. What did Thomas Taylor think about? I mean, how do the Pardon? how do the scholars how have the scholars handled this problem? Like Thomas Taylor and Ralphs and the others. Well, Thomas Taylor uh, goes to this thinker called this author Olympia Doris, and he says that forever that expression. Uh, is, he has a whole view that. Uh, when the planets uh, are in line in a certain way, whether it's Saturn and, and the different planets, that that represents a certain period of time for the Greeks. And what they were really talking about is talking about people being locked in Tartarus for one of those lengthy periods of time brought about by the... Con like an age or something. An age, that's right. It's that's that's yeah, how. For us, that would be forever, but... Yeah, but you see... But you eventually get out. Yeah. yeah. But see, I like Olympia Doris' solution, but there is, it doesn't fit the math. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't fit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the, but, the, yes, please, go ahead. I have a minor question, which might not have any significance, but the Turks were called Tartars. Mm. Oh, that's where they got it. That's what, so that's yeah, the Catholic Church got the, all of this from yeah. Plato. Mm. Then there the, the, the Tartars from Central Asia who came down. Oh, that's a different Tartar. That's, that's a different, different Tartar. Yeah. Same name. Called Tartars, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Um, I like that solution. Yeah. Just, it just means an epic or an era, a time cycle. Or the one that you gave last week, which is that if Hitler had to face every single person that he ever yeah. affected. Yeah. That would be almost forever. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's and enough they time. they decide when he needed to, when it was okay for him to come out, and it could, and they, it may be several times for each person mm -hmm. before they yeah. think it's okay for him to come out. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would say that would be almost forever. Mm -hmm. It's stalling the same. Well, see, that's taking the limpid Doris' view that they're really talking about yeah. long period. Yeah. Epochs or epochs, yeah. or ages, or whatever. Yeah, but it's difficult to find that in the myth. Yeah. So therefore, last thought. All right, I'm going to return. We may have to look at this myth in an entirely different way, because it does not, it cannot be reconciled in any way with the dialogue itself. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I leave you with that. Oh, no. no. Pardon? What dialogue are we talking about? Oh. Gorgias. Oh, oh that, that's the name of the dialogue. That's the name of the dialogue. And the last five pages is the note. Oh, okay. So it says, Gorgias, a true story, now, a true tale. A true tale. <laughs> <laughs> no, I look here, I totally agree with it, but I just wanted to let so you know. So we can come back next week and get... We'll hmm. come back next week and find the answer. Find out. <laughs> <laughs> no, next week we're going into, How I believe... Go ahead. The central idea of art from the Ion and the Republic, which is absolutely central to this whole thing. Okay, and that's where we're going. That's the key idea in Greek thought. Idea of art. You grasp that. Have you resolved this? Why should I tell you? You'll be on my back trying to get it from me. <laughs> Thank you. I enjoyed sharing the mystery with you. Oh, pass it around.